Hello everyone, bringing you a video today looking at a recreation of a British infantry officer serving in France in the early spring of 1940, just prior to the German invasion. This kit is a kit I had out. I'd uh, pulled all this out preparatory to taking part in the Lord Mayor's Parade in London. And unfortunately, a little bout of ill health uh, put paid to that idea. I wasn't able to take part. Uh, nothing to do with COVID, I hasten to add. But unfortunately, as I say, I just wasn't able, it wasn't uh, viable for me to travel down and march through London, unfortunately. Hopefully next year, maybe, if I'm, if I'm invited, of course. And my apologies again to the, the organisers that I couldn't make it. But nevertheless, I thought as I had the kit out and I'm now feeling much better, I'd take the opportunity to have a look at this. Without further ado, we'll get into the main part of the video now and have a look at the recreation, the uniform and the kit that's worn here. So looking at an overview of this recreation, you can see here fairly typical uniform and equipment for the British Army during the Second World War. And then we have battle dress and so forth here and the 1937 pattern web equipment. The first thing we'll look at in more detail, however, is the Mark II steel helmet, which you can see here. And this is an early example of the Mark II, which has been looked at in a previous video with the various features you would expect from an early issue example of this helmet. The basic uniform, as already said, consists of battle dress, this being battle dress serge, which is the, the first pattern, the first standard pattern of battle dress introduced to the British Army. Many officers and men serving out in France had arrived wearing service dress and looked very much like their Great War counterparts. But by 1940, increasing issues of battle dress were being made to men in the field and new arrivals were generally arriving wearing battle dress. A collar attached cotton shirt is worn with a wool tie and you can see this at the neck. And rank insignia is worn in a subdued form on the epaulettes for battle dress. You can see here a single bath star representing a second lieutenant. And as you can see, these have a drab backing. They are very much subdued. They do not have the arm of service coloured backing, which would be introduced a little bit later in the war. With only rank insignia worn, British officers and men at this time period did look rather drab. And this would change in the coming years with the introduction of formation signs and other colourful insignia. The web equipment consists of 1937 pattern. And this is set up in a form which the fitting instructions describe as being for officers, certain warrant officers and certain NCOs. So it's primarily intended for commissioned officers, but was also used or was intended to be used by certain warrant officers and NCOs where this was appropriate. The belt, braces, the water bottle carrier and the haversack carried on the back are all part of the standard equipment and as would be used by infantrymen using basic pouches and so forth. But the basic pouches themselves have been replaced with carriers for the officer's accoutrements and obviously the pistol as well and brace attachments are used to support the belt at the front though they aren't visible. Looking at the wearer's left we can see here the pistol case and the ammunition pouch. The pistol case contains a revolver, the Enfield number no. 2 Mark 1 and this is secured with a lanyard. You can see there's a lanyard attached to the butt of the revolver here and this is looped up around the neck to secure the revolver. The ammunition pouch is carried above the pistol case and this is supported through a, a small webbing loop on the back through which the brace loops and this supports it up against the brace attachment. It also clips onto the pistol case, essentially making the brace attachment, the pistol case and the ammunition pouch one unit, although it is made up of three separate pieces of webbing which have to be attached to one another. On the other side, we have the binocular case and this functions in a very similar manner. The Binocular case is an early example. You can see it doesn't have buckles on the sides. These were introduced later on to allow the binocular case to be carried separately using a single brace as a shoulder strap. The compass pouch is similar in dimensions to the pistol ammunition pouch, but it is stiffened and contains padding to protect the compass when carried. You can also see here the L straps hooked into the top of the brace attachment. So this particular feature of the web equipment works in exactly the same manner as if basic pouches or cartridge carriers were being worn in place of the officer's accoutrements. The L straps support the standard 1937 pattern haversack on the back and you can see here the ground sheet has been rolled and folded underneath the flap of this. On the right hip the enamel water bottle in its felt cover is carried in the water bottle carrier. The initial design of 1937 pattern or the initial intention behind the design was that the water bottle would be carried inside the haversack and that this water bottle carrier would only be used in marching order with, when the equipment was worn in marching order for changing stations when extra capacity would be needed in the haversack but certainly in 1940 it's not uncommon to see it being carried on the hip as we have here when the equipment was worn in battle order with the haversack on the back rather than the pack. On the other hip, we have the officer's haversack. This is another specific part of the equipment designed for use by officers and certain warrant officers and NCOs. 
And this is designed to carry writing implements, paperwork, that sort of thing, things specific to an officer's role. With these 1937 patent components, the equipment is essentially analogous to the private purchase mills officer's web equipment, which had been introduced in the latter days of the Great War and then used and developed further in the interwar years. It essentially fulfills the same purpose, but in a standard issue form. In addition to the web equipment, a map case is carried. You can see that here. It's made of canvas and leather, private purchase example, very similar to those that would have been purchased for use during the Great War as well. No great change there. There is a video covering this elsewhere on the channel in more detail. Anti-gas equipment is also being carried, and on the chest we have the Mark V respirator haversack, and this contains the general service respirator, gas detection brassards, an anti-dimming outfit, anti-gas ointment, and eye shields, and cotton waste for use with the anti-gas ointment as well. Round on the shoulders, the anti-gas cape is carried, and this is secured using the integral tapes which are looped over the top and then tied off to the D-rings on the respirator haversack, the cape is carried rolled inside out and in theory it should roll down the back when these tapes are released and it can then be donned. It's referred to as a cape but it's closer to a jacket really, a raincoat in many respects. It does have sleeves and it can be buttoned around the body so when it unrolls it can be pulled around the body, arms into the sleeves and then buttoned up at the front. So the idea of this is to allow it to be put on very quickly in the case of a gas attack. The final thing to look at is of course the footwear and we have here a pair of Private purchase officers' ankle boots worn with the standard webbing anklets associated with the 1937 pattern web equipment. The boots themselves are very similar to the British Army's GS boots. They are slightly different in shape, slightly more refined shape to the toe, slightly more pointed. And as I say, they would be private purchase. They are made in pebble grain leather, the same as the GS boots, but obviously in brown leather and probably of slightly greater quality as well. They are hobnailed, so they essentially serve the same purpose but as I say, officer's private purchase boots worn here. So there we are, let's look at this recreation. As I say, this represents a British officer certainly in the early war years. As the war drew on, certainly junior officers would start to wear equipment which didn't differentiate them so much from their men. So they'd tend to wear basic pouches later on. This is very common to see in Normandy, although pistol equipment like this would not entirely disappear. It's almost a lesson relearned from the Great War where officers, and certainly in a frontline role, junior officers would try to wear a kit and equipment which didn't mark them out from the men. Obviously, you become a, a marked target in that regard. And so this sort of equipment, which much as it is fairly subdued, the web equipment and so forth, as opposed to wearing leather Sam Brown equipment, it still does differentiate you from the men you're leading. And certainly later in the war, it would be more common to see officers using basic pouches in place of this equipment. But say it doesn't disappear entirely. That's just a trend that's seen through the war. So anyway, that was a look at a recreation of a British infantry officer, a second lieutenant, serving in France in early 1940. Hopefully you found it interesting looking at this. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, where there will of course be photographs of this posted up as well, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch with me but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.